As we journey through this Lenten season, let us be reminded that not all journeys are linear. In Christ's death, there is deep trauma, sorrow, and grief. But in Christ's life, there is an eternal, all-consuming hope that transforms our ability to love and to be loved. As people prepare their hearts for the resurrection of Christ, many make self-pledges to give up something of comfort and security with the goal of becoming spiritually closer to the divine. As we process who has taken this journey before us, who is taking this journey with us, and who will take this journey after us, may we give up devices that divide us and take on practices that build community and unite us. This season, I give up racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and misogyny. I take on the practice of accepting others and embracing those with whom we have differences. I give up self-hate and shame about who I am, the space I take up, and the words that I say. I take on the practice of self-care, gentleness towards myself, and unapologetic existence. Once I give up judgment, secrecy, and hate, we as one body take up authenticity and love. Amen.
that we as black LGBTQ plus people, we have a long and treasured history that's fraught with many lumps and bumps in the road. However, we have survived to tell this tale. Where do we go from here? My hope is that these young people, and I will name them because naming is important, Mel, Jess, Adina, Michaela, Martin, and all of the other names that I have missed. I hope that you will bring about a new day where love, mutual respect, acceptance, and open doors will be for all of us. Thank you. Before I get, begin, I want to ask um, by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Bayard Rustin before? Bayard Rustin. Okay, so a, a significant majority of the congregation has not, which is um, not surprising. Um, because ignorance of Bayard Rustin is pretty widespread. Although it's kind of surprising given how important he was in civil rights history. Um, Rustin was one of the key shakers and movers behind the African American Civil Rights Movement in the mid-20th century. Um, he was an advisor and mentor to Martin Luther King Jr., actually. Um, he was the main organizer of the March on Washington in 1963, um, which we mostly remember now from, uh, for MLK's famous speech, I Have a Dream, um, but that was Rustin's doing. And arguably, Rustin had a significant role to play in um, securing many of the victories of the civil rights movement that we enjoy today. But there was one problem, and that was that he was gay. And so even at the time of the movement, he was kept out of the spotlight on purpose because of his sexuality. Um, so other civil rights activists actually wanted to oust him from the movement, and that did eventually happen. Um, at the direction of MLK. And since that time, Rustin, especially after his death, has kind of been erased from history, which is why most of us um, don't know about him. And so this poem is a tribute to Rustin's legacy and an attempt to correct all of our collective memories so we can remember this very important predecessor. <clears throat> and by the way, the title refers to the fact that um, he started out life um, pursuing music, a singing career, um, before he became a peace activist. Did the woman who raised you, your grandmother, know that you would grow up to be an American hero, unsung? Did she know that the Quaker faith she gifted you would water the roots of our country's march towards equality? Did she know that her ambivalence to the other part of you that America hates would liberate you from the shame that traps and kills so many of us? Did she know that she had not equipped you for a world that very much believed that your love for other men was a shame? Maybe she knew that shame is an odd protectant, like a gun that deters assault until you turn the barrel on yourself. Did King ever credit you for teaching him the ways of nonviolence? Do history books ever note that you visited India first, years before King, to study the ways of Gandhi? How old was King? 25? With armed guards outside his family home, with armed guards secretly watching over protesters as they marched in case the Klan decided to strike. Did King travel to Al the Algerian desert to stand on ground that the French planned to obliterate with fission? King initially embraced nonviolence as a tactic, but you, a cradle Quaker, insisted it was a way of life. How many people know that you were the mastermind behind the most important civil rights protest in American history? How many people know that you were arrested and beaten for refusing to give up your seat on a bus a decade before Rosa Parks made headlines and history books for doing the same. One thing your enemies did know and broadcasted widely was that you were arrested for sexual perversion. 
Would you have been jailed if you were with two women in the back of a car rather than two men? Did anyone send King to see a doctor to curb his sexual desires? Did anyone tell King that his indiscretions would distract from the movement? When a politician threatened to publicly accuse you and King of having a sexual relationship, who was removed from the movement? This was a movement whose basic principle was peace, a movement that was a fight for human rights and dignity and freedom. Did they fight for you as a lover of other men to be free? Did they fight for your rights or your dignity? Did they fight for you to live your life in peace? Where are the statues, the monuments, the memorials to your life, to your legacy, to your angel voice singing hymns of freedom, passed down from the ancestors whose bodies were shackled, but spirits were free? You said, the person who believes in nonviolence is prepared to be crushed, but he will never crush others. A mantra you not only preached, but you lived as a black man, as a gay man. What does it mean to be a woman? Would you be angry with me? Disappointed? Upset? Scared? Would you hate me? After all, you sacrificed everything for Mormonism, and I couldn't bring myself to make the same choice. Growing up, I was always a tomboy, and sometimes it was considered okay. My sisters were tomboys too in their own way. Even my mom isn't like every other woman. She is a little stronger, a little bolder. I remember always aspiring to be like her as I grew older. As a working single mom, she sacrificed everything to make sure her kids made it. But sometimes we aren't meant to be just like our parents, no matter how hard we try. Your name is Ada Clements, and you're my great, 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 great grandmother. You and your husband, Albert, joined the Mormon Church just two years after it was founded by Joseph Smith. Persecution forced you to flee from New York to Ohio to Missouri. In Missouri, your son Paul was killed by an anti-Mormon mob. You must have known what Mary felt as she wept at the cross. I hated wearing dresses to church, weddings, and other fancy occasions. I would cry nearly every time as a young girl when I was forced to dress this way. But this is how you have to dress today. It's the way things are, my mother would say. The clothes felt uncomfortable and stupid. Not me at all. But I had to suck it up because I saw that is what I was expected to do. I spent years trying to look the way women were expected to. I bought their blouses and jewelry. I started wearing my hair down too. I even tried mascara a time or two. I was finally looking the part decently well. No one could tell that I was unhappy with how I looked or how it felt. Even I became complacent as I wanted so badly to fit in. I wanted to be the right kind of woman, the one everyone else was trying to be. I remember getting dressed and looking hard in the mirror. I knew that I looked right and that I even looked good, but I, I always felt like something was off about it all. I just stood there, not, not, not really knowing who I was looking at. But finally, things got better. You and Albert helped found Nauvoo, Illinois, where you and your religious community were finally able to live in peace, even prosperity. Then the world ended. Joseph Smith was killed, and suddenly the church was thrown into chaos because no one knew who should succeed God's prophet. In those darkest of days, you even lost the one person you had, who had stood with you at every step of this painful journey, your husband, Albert. After 21 years of trying to hide, I finally burst out of my bubble and redefined what a woman could look like. Me, I, woman, female, redefined. I cut off my hair, I bought baggier jeans, shorts to my knees, and I stopped wearing dresses. That part was really easy. I threw away the makeup and I gave away my old clothes. I remember pausing again, 
and looking hard in the mirror at myself. Only this time, I smiled, because I saw someone I knew looking back at me. I saw myself. It was around this time that I also came out as a gay woman. I think some people think I dress this way because I am gay, but it's really not the case. It's a different part of who I am, though the common thing between the two is that they both took a lot of guts to embrace, and they both are totally not the way a woman is expected to behave. You and Albert disagreed on who should be leading the church. Albert thought your family should follow his good friend, Sid Sidney Rigdon, so the church should stay in Nauvoo. You supported Brigham Young, who said the only way for the church to live in peace was to flee west. Instead of finding hope and comfort in each other, you and Albert made what must have been the most difficult decision of both your lives. In 1852, you got a divorce. Albert stayed in Illinois. You and your seven living children went west to Utah. My mother was not happy. You're a woman, she would say. Yes, I am. Why is that in question, I would reply. You are a woman, she would say again and again and again. You are not a man. I don't believe myself to be a man. I just want to be my own kind of woman. Maybe I don't even want to be either, but I know I don't want to look or be like all the other girls. I want to be myself. I'm tired of trying to be someone else. Who made up all these rules? Why do women need long hair or dresses? Why are women the ones who should cover up their blemishes with makeup and liner? Why can't men do some of the above? Every rule feels like a mask that I'm expected to wear to cover up what makes me unique. And if you like this masquerade, fine. But it's just not me. I want to be free. Ada, you did the unthinkable. You are a woman living in the 1850s who divorced her husband instead of obeying him. How deeply you must have believed in this ragtag religion to be willing to sacrifice the love of your life for it. How did it feel to know you'd never see the man you loved again? Was it worth it? Is any religion, any prophet, any god worth tearing your family apart? I wish I could ask you that, because in many ways, we faced the same choice, but I chose differently. You sacrificed your marriage for your faith. I am leaving the faith you bequeathed to me because I want to get married. I've had to stay strong. I've had to push through the pressure I felt my whole life in order to be true to myself. But I've also fought hard to be kind, to be loyal, to become a doctor of physical therapy, to be the best I can be for my friends, for my patients, for my family. I have fought, I have fought, I have fought for many things. I don't think either of us really wants to admit it right now, but my mom and I are much more alike, alike than we are different. I thought of you when I was making my choice, profit or partner church or family, safety or happiness. I wondered, even worried, if you would be angry. Would you say, I sacrificed my home, my son, and my husband for my faith? Who are you to think a life of celibacy is too hard? Maybe that is what you would say, but I hope not. As crazy as it seems, I hope you're a little proud of me. I know that when my mom looks at me, she doesn't believe I am living as a woman should. I am a woman who married a woman who shops in the men's side of the store. But what you see is who I am, and more. And I have fought hard to get here. I have fought hard to be authentic and true to myself. I have fought hard to choose love over self-hate. I have fought hard to redefine what being a woman is for me. And my mom fought hard to redefine womanhood for herself too. She had believed in the necessity of a husband. She had believed in him being the breadwinner, in him being the decision maker, in him being the leader. But when that reality was all stripped away, she knew she could not think the same way. She took on all of those roles and more. I know people doubted her ability to do all that she has done, and I know people often said, if only she had a man. But look, she did it. Walking away from the Mormon church will always be one of the most difficult decisions of my life. 
I love Mormonism with everything I had. Its imprint will forever be on my soul, and leaving it broke my heart. But I felt I had no other choice. Ada, I think you know the feeling. So strange as it may seem, as I fi finally found a new identity, a new community, I thought of you. I found comfort and strength in you because you taught me that women are strong enough to have their hearts broken again and again and still keep moving. You taught me that women are brave enough to be vulnerable and that vulnerability is not weakness. You taught me to hope even when all logic says not to. More than anything, you taught me women are strong enough to do the unthinkable. I know our stories are not exactly the same, but I believe that when life looked each of us in the face and begged us to redefine what being a woman was, we both took that daring step in the direction that was out of our comfort zone. We both took those preconceived ideas of what a woman was and said, I don't think that's going to be me. I'm trying to be the best woman I can be, regardless of what other people think. And so did you, Mom. So did you. Ada, your story has a happy Ada, your story has a happy ending. In 1872, your son paid for Albert to move out west. Then, your son arranged a surprise meeting between you and the man you loved, divorced 20 years before, and thought you'd never see again. You and Albert quickly realized you were still very much in love. You remarried and lived the rest of your lives together. Ada, I think my story will have a happy ending too. I think that I will be brave enough to be happy because you taught me to be bold, to be hopeful, to be strong, to be vulnerable. You taught me to do the unthinkable. What, what is a woman anyway? anyway? Well, it's my mother, my great grandmother, and, and me. I probably super don't need the microphone. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a story. Most of you will probably think that you know what the story is, or have heard it before. But I guarantee you, no one in this room, except for Jennifer and Jonathan, because they heard me practice this last night, <laughs> have heard the entire thing like this. How I ended up here at Digby Memorial. So, I've been a member here for about five years. So, five years ago, this January, I was at a friend's house, Eric, in Kentville. It's a Friday night, and Eric was like, why don't you come to church with me on Sunday? He knew two things. One, I had been looking for a church, and two, I was still going to be on his couch on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, I was like, well, I, I don't know Eric, I don't know anything about this church, I hadn't done the research, are they welcoming, affirming, all of this. He's like, well, they have a gay pastor. Okay, sure, why not? I'll try. Because <laughs> they have a gay pastor that can't be all that bad. I know they have to at least be affirming in certain ways, and okay. So Sunday morning rolls around, we start the drive here. And I ask, so what denomination is it? Eric says, oh, I think it's Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up Catholic. You know Episcopal. Episcopal's just Catholic light. I'm, I'm going to understand the word of service. It's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. So, we get here, and apparently, unlike Eric, I read the sign out front, <laughs> and it says Presbyterian. I know nothing. If it had said Baptist, I would have known more. They wouldn't have had a gay pastor, but I would have known more about them. But I stick with the fact Eric says they have a gay pastor. Okay. So I walk in. First person I meet is Lynn. She is super welcoming. She's only met Eric a handful of times and gives him a big hug. And I see Jennifer. Rogue, stole, she must be their pastor. Okay, she's gay, got it. <laughs> so we sit there during service, and for the first hour that I am in this community, I know Jennifer to be gay. <laughs> okay. Five minutes after service, Eric introduces me to the person who he was actually talking about. Tanya Denny, who was the parish associate here at the time. Now, for those of you who know Tanya, you know, you look at Tanya, for good, bad, or indifferent, you know that she is gay. 
And I quickly realized that for the last hour, I had thought somebody was gay that maybe wasn't. <laughs> so, whoops. <laughs> a year and a half later, everyone else, as well as myself, realizes and knows that Jennifer comes out as gay. Perfect. I was right. Aha. <laughs> and then after some pointed conversations from Lynn to Jennifer, hey, why aren't you and Lauren dating? From Tanya to me, hey, I saw you look at Jennifer that way. <laughs> Jennifer and I figured our lives out. But let's back up. Let's rewind to that year and a half prior. Yeah, the warned you I was going to know. I know. <laughs> Why was I at my friend Eric's on a Friday night? Why did he know I was looking for a church? And why did he know I was still going to be at his house on Sunday morning? And this was, this was Friday, so this is two nights away. So, what some of you know, but many of you might not, is three months prior to that, I lost my grandmother. <laughs> my grandmother was one of my best friends. I'm going to avoid looking at my mom right now. It's already starting to cry. <laughs> now, my, mom, my grandmother, lifelong Republican, lifelong Catholic, didn't shy away from either of those things, taught me a lot about the one, not so much about the Republican thing. She was the only one in the family at time. But, she knew her granddaughter was gay. She didn't care. I never had to have that coming out conversation with her. I had a girlfriend. I brought her around. My grandmother knew who she was. She wasn't stupid. But she didn't care. I was her Lilliputian. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, Lilliputian, Gulliver's Travel, the Lilliputians in the land of Lilliput. Which is true. And my grandmother did like that book. The Lilliputian is also the Gaelic term for little one. I was her little one. The amount that she taught me about God, about the Bible, about religion, and how to challenge it every step of the way. A couple of conversations, I would say, you know, but the priest said this, but sister said, <laughs> sister said, but Lauren, Jesus said, but Lauren, the Bible says, this theologian, wait a minute, your grandfather's got a book, hold on. <laughs> she taught me how to make the decisions that I have made about my faith. She didn't give me all of my faith, though she definitely gave me my faith in, and how I act towards, towards the Mother Mary. It's a Catholic thing. There's a statue of Mary in my grandmother's house, and every time her flowers bloomed, there was a new flower for Mary. That I was taught. That she passed down. The other things that she passed down were how to challenge the Bible, how to challenge God, but also how to give God what I couldn't handle in the moment. Give it to God, Lauren. Kiss it up to God. So, three months, before I show up here, I lost that. That person who had become my church, my community of faith, because I grew up Catholic. The church didn't, didn't believe in all that who I was anymore. They didn't think that I was a complete human being because I was gay. So that I had lost a while before. I just lost my grandmother. So Eric knew that. Eric knew that I was at his house, spending time with friends as much as humanly possible, because I was grieving. In healthy, I was with friends. And unhealthy ways. I was going to have gin in my hand until Sunday morning. <laughs> and I show up here. And the first person that I meet walking through that door, if you remember the, the story, was Lynn. Now some of you have seen the picture, some of you haven't. Lynn is the spitting image of my grandma. Doesn't sound like her, doesn't move like her, but if my grandmother had a doppelganger, it's like her. So call it a coincidence or God dropping an anvil on my head saying, here, Lauren, I found a place for you. 
here's the family you were looking for. I found it. You all treated me with open arms, didn't care who I was, who I loved, gave me the community that I could argue the Bible with, still do, gave me the community of faith that showed me God's love again. That there were churches, there were communities of faith that still treated people that way. Now, fast forward five years, you guys have also given me a wife and a son. There is nothing in the last five years of my life that this church hasn't either given me, supported me through, loved me through, prayed for me through, unemployment, all of it. And I don't know that you guys do this consciously. Hey, we found her. This is the one. We're going we're gonna to fix her life. <laughs> <laughs> my, my guess is, though, that you all simply let the Spirit move through you. Let the love of God move through you. And you should know that this is what you do. You take someone who was grieving so very interesting ways and gave her everything. And I can't thank you enough. There is nothing that I can do to repay everything this community has been for me. But I can say thank you. busy life to be able to make the artwork for us that's on the front of the bulletin. So, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. And um, since we're taking time to look at Jennifer's lovely tree, I think it's a great segue um, into talking about this lovely tree that's not fully bloomed yet, but um, it's uh, back here on the table. Um, it's called the Sankofa tree. and. Um, the reason why I titled it the Sankofa tree is because it's a, it's a term from Ghana, which means to go back and fetch it. And I felt like it's an appropriate term to frame today's um, service because we were talking about people of our past. And um, the whole concept of going back and fetching it is about uh, reflecting upon your past and learning about the people who came before you so that you can better navigate your present life. So it's the whole concept of standing on the shoulders of your ancestors in order to help build you up as a person and um, help to propel you forward so that you can have a brighter future. Um, so with that being said, I would just like for everyone to be able to take a moment and just as, as you all reflect on the stories we're being told, take a moment to reflect on your own stories and Think about some people of your past that is helping to build you up in the present day. And as you're thinking about that, I want you to, to actually, um, if a name comes to mind and if you feel led, I would like for you to come up to the front. We actually um, have labels and pens. And you can come up to the front and write the name down of that person. But not only do I want you to think about someone of the past, I also would like for you to think about someone who is presently in your life that you would like to have a positive impact on their future. And also take some time and write their name on these labels too. So you're gonna be putting two labels on the tree. One of someone from the past who has positively impacted you, and then one of someone who is in your life right now that you would like to have a positive impact on their future. Um, so yeah, just take a moment and think about those things and Feel free to come up to the front and put those names on the tree as you feel like. Run away, you say, no one will love you as you are. 
Thank you.